Live from Salt Lake City, Utah, this is Heart of the Matter, where we do all we can to worship God in spirit and truth. I'm your host, Sean McCraney. We have entered into doing some uh, interviews this year. We have did a lot last year, and people like them, and there's been some very interesting people. Tonight, we have the pleasure uh, of Lindsay Hansen Park, who has donated her time and will donate her talents to sharing her mind with us, and I'm very excited. In a couple of weeks, we're going to have uh, John ha uh, Hadjasek, who claims to be the most unusual Mormon on the face of the earth. I look forward to that. And then also Dave Donaldson, who runs a prison ministry, and he has some fantastic stories of life, lives that are changed through that ministry. But tonight, the pleasure, uh, I am now introducing you, of having Lindsay Hansen Park. Thank you for being with us. Hey, thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. Uh, just to let you know, I went out and I kind of searched around uh, for names in the community and in the state and in the religion. Um, Lindsay is definitely a name. And uh, so I messaged her and uh, she readily uh, said, uh, you know, yeah, let's try to do this. And so here we are. Before we get into it, I have to make an admission. I, I love to approach interviews with uh, the least amount of preparation on my part uh, because I think there's a better uh, uh, natural growth in the conversation if I go that way. But I, I have to admit, I have been more tempted this past uh, week to really find out what you're all about than anybody we've ever done. We've had some really unique guests. Uh, most interviewers, you know, they do the research and everything else. But uh, my admission is that um, I've really been tempted to read up on you. I have not done it. I looked at your bio description. Maybe it was on your Facebook page. And I think it said, uh, uh, I was going to say lobbyist. Uh, <laughs> it says that you are a, uh, wait, independent Mormon. It says that you are a blogger. Sure. Yeah. Executive uh, director of Sunstone Magazine. Is it Sunstone Magazine? It's the Sunstone Education Foundation, and we do have a magazine. And so. you do have a magazine yes. included. Okay. And uh, your mother of yes. three, uh -huh. all sick right now. All sick. Look, he does. He does research. Yeah. Well, you told me that before when you got Did here. Did you find anything about the secret tap dancing career? Because that was the highlight of my that life. That will be a part two. I was six. It was That's great. it. Um, but I've been told by a couple people that Lindsay's very smart and well-educated and being a feminist, it intimidated me. I mean, I, I'm just saying, I'm a little bit intimidated. One, I don't want uh, her to outdo me. Uh, I'm thinking that. I don't want her to outdo me. And then I'm thinking, I am, a, I am an old school dude, man. And so I'm entering into an arena. I have three daughters. One, the middle one is a feminist. and. I still step on my uh, coattails almost every time I get involved you, with it. You don't need to worry. I ate the baby in the car right before it started. All right, good. It's fine. Good. So, um, All filled up. Uh, it's really good that you're here. Um, if there's any errors that in my description of you that uh, you need to clarify, please do. But what, like I've told you, uh, what I would love for you to do we, we do this with almost all the guests, is to go back and give your history of grandparents and mom and dad, siblings growing up here, I think in Murray, um, and then how you developed to what you have become today. And then I'm hoping that, and then include your husband, education, and then in the last 10 or 15 minutes, we can maybe say, and then all of this has taken me to uh, blogging, my podcast, and then, I mean, you're doing so much with the Sunstone Foundation, everything else, and then next week, we will enter into a back and forth on these concepts. Sure. Uh, first of all, I'd like to point out that you've made a terrible mistake what? by asking me to talk about family history because it's my favorite subject. Oh. So if I get into the weeds, you got to just pull me right I'll out. pull you back. Okay. Uh, Grandparents? Yeah, just in brief. Uh, in brief, I come from pioneer, Mormon pioneer uh, settler stock, right? Uh, most of my family lines can be traced back to the Mormon settlers that came and colonized, you know, the Great Basin. And uh, 
Yeah, my parent, my dad's side grew up in San Pete, Utah. My my grandfather was a shepherd mm. in Fountain Green, mm. and my grandmother was one of the richest uh, ladies in the town. And they have this great little romance of rich and poor getting together. And then he worked at the Kennecott Mine for the rest of his life, and mm. they lived. They moved to Murray. My mother comes from German immigrants that came. They, we have some pioneer stock, but most of them came um, as sort of religious refugees, uh, that's how they tell the story at least, uh, from after World War I. And uh, had faced a lot of discrimination in Utah being uh, <coughs> German, mm. you know, during World War II. They had swastikas burned on their lawn and bricks thrown through their window. And so I kind of grew up on those narratives. And then, then my <coughs> own parents, uh, Mormon, uh, I come from a Mormon mom and a, and a semi-Mormon dad. And my mom, she loves history like I do. And so I grew up with a public historian mother. She would dress up as a pioneer <laughs> or Betsy Ross, depending mm. on the occasion. And we would go to schools and libraries and uh, church, act church uh, functions, and we would tell pioneer stories and stories about, I, I can tell you so many things about the history of the American flag. It's not even funny. Mm. But that's what I did growing up as a kid. So. Mm. I just sort of learned to love family history because it's so important to the sort of fabric of my own family. Mm -hmm. uh, siblings? I have three siblings. We were an adequate Mormon family. There were six of us, which uh, sometimes felt too <laughs> small and sometimes felt so big when we were out of state. Uh, yeah, I have a brother and I have two sisters and they're all finally back in Utah, so. Finally back. So growing up uh, with, and mom and dad, and dad was semi-active, sort mm -hmm. of? Yeah, I don't know how familiar your audience is with that parlance of pretty, active. Pretty familiar. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so my, my dad and mom, we attended every week. We were pretty devout. My dad was uh, less, I mean, he just wasn't into it as much. He would Did go Did he drink coffee thing. is the question. No, no, that's the thing. I mean, that's a good <laughs> marker. He probably would have. Oh, okay. I, so my, my family were the kind that like we would go out to dinner every Sunday with, with my dad's parents until out I, to dinner. Uh, yeah, like, like which in, in Mormonism is a problem in Utah because you're not supposed to what we call break the Sabbath, which means you don't spend money or you don't make other people work on the Sabbath. So I just like every single Sunday, every Sunday, as long as I can remember, we would go to the New China Buffet down in West Jordan area, and my grandparents would get the halibut, and I would get whatever I would get, and that's what we would do until I was in ninth grade and I went to seminary, and oh. I learned that that was wrong, and I changed that for our family. I was really self-righteous about it and came home and said, like, we can't do this, and I, and I kind of regret that because it was a really nice family tradition. Huh. Fascinating. Yeah. And they followed your lead. They did, you know... I'm really good with the Mormon shame. It's a gift. What can I say? Mm -hmm. Are they still following your lead? Uh, yeah, they are. I've left a really solid legacy there. So. <laughs> good. Yeah. All right. So uh, mom and dad, um, uh, then uh, your activities, you said ninth grade, you went into seminary. Uh, you do four years? I did. I, I actually, where I went to high school, Murray High, you could letter in seminary, like you could letter in a sport. What? And that is the only thing I lettered in was seminary, so. It's awesome. Like, like no, for real. You, you get got like the a, you, letter. It's a CTR symbol, which is like oh. a ring. Like this is a, it's a shield. And it's, I think it says CTR, yeah. And you sew on your, your jacket if you actually lettered in other things that matter. Do you still have the jacket? No, I never oh. got the jacket. I just got the patch. You just got the patch. Because yeah. I knew, like, I was, I was like, ooh, I lettered in seminary. Cool, I get a patch. But I also knew it was kind of dumb. You did. All right. So. Yeah. I'm just seeing where you were on that. I didn't know if no, you proudly no, bore it. No, like, or... I was into it. Don't, don't get me wrong. But, like, I, was, I feel like I was cool enough to know, like, don't put that on a jacket. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I got to jump ahead. Just one question. Now that I've got you in front of me, we can do it on camera. You're still LDS. Yes. Okay. Yep. And in the uh, spectrum of activism, where are you? Oh, I'm not sure where you're at. Being active. Oh, oh, and I, uh, so that's an interesting question, and I'm going to give you the answer that I always give, and it infuriates people. This is not me being dodgy. So what you're really asking is if I go to church, mm. right? That. 
but it's it's on a continuum. Do you go to church? If you don't go to church, do you drink coffee? If you don't, do you drink? Do you drink? Will you he drink just a beer? Wants to get me in trouble with my bishop? Tonight. No, That's no, no, no. I'm just. What, do you see R-rated movies or are you a no R-rated? I'm just wondering yeah, where no, no, in the no. spectrum. I get it. I get it. So what I say is I'm active in the Mormon movement because I actually feel like terms like active within our community are uh, harmful terms. They're meant to signal loyalty to the institution. And so one of the things that I've learned over time, especially working with marginalized communities in Mormonism and vulnerable communities in Mormonism is language like that harms. It's, I mean, it's just what we do, but what Mormons want to know is how loyal are you to the institution? Mm -hmm. And so to answer your question, I do not attend my LDS ward. That's a strategic decision. Um, and it's, an, it's a moral decision. I attend lots of Mormon church, but not always LDS, and we can get into that later on. I, uh, part of my work deals with, um, I work with some of the over 400 groups of extant um, expressions of the restoration mm. movement, so anything that came out of Joseph Smith, I explore, and what my weird brag is I have unique access to some of the most isolated religious communities in the American West. Mm. So I do Mormonism all the time. I'm very active in the Mormon movement, but uh, I have a tattoo now. Um, I'm trying to think. I no longer wear my garments. Mm. That's something that Mormons care about. Uh, and again, that is a deliberate decision. Uh, I, I took my Mormon covenants in the temple. I was married in the temple very seriously, and I still do. And so to me, it's sort of an act of autonomy and resistance towards some of the harmful narratives, if that makes sense. Yeah, we'll come that back to that. That's better in part than a simple yes or no, right? In part two, we'll come back to this discussion because that's fascinating, uh, especially uh, it's kind of, at least in my mind, it is sort of new to refer to Mormon uh, to include everything. I guess it's always sure. been that way. But that's kind of a new thing, newer thing, isn't it? I would say uh, when you're an activist, you always have an agenda, and that's my agenda. And, I'm, and I think the best I can do for my community that I serve and the community that I love is be honest about what my agenda is. And my agenda is uh, being honest about the history, which would include that, you know, everybody, <laughs> this is the fun thing. I deal with so many different Mormon groups. Everyone thinks they're the one true church. Everyone thinks they're the original church. And the, and the historical reality is there's n no one exact linear line from Joseph Smith's church that he started. And so that's why we, uh, Steve Shields, who is a researcher and historian on this, he claims over 487 extant expressions. Wow. We don't always call groups because sometimes it's like two guys in the living room with an <laughs> altar. So, which is fine. Uh, Not my a, jam, but with it an happens. Altar. Yeah. That's awesome. We're Mormons, man. We got to yeah. have altars. <laughs> Makes us legit. Uh, so yeah, uh, I want to include that, and I th and I actually think that Mormon signaling it, uh, has a historical precedent that that goes back to the frontier period in Utah, and what came out of that as a survival strategy for Brigham Young and, and to keep this institution cohesive, we develop all of these signaling like, so if you wear a tank top, we know that you're not a good Mormon. Mm -hmm. And so I deliberately like to disrupt that narrative. I'll show up in tank tops uh, to Mormon functions. I'll claim that I'm LDS and people online will lose their minds and say, you don't get to be LDS. And I'm like, I, uh, what are you gonna do about it? Mm -hmm. You know, I am. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of the things we're doing at Sunstone Art, and we can talk about this later, but, uh, we developed this tagline that says there's more than one way to Mormon. Mm. And because that's the reality, uh, it's not like the performance that we all know how to do on Sunday. Everyone knows how to wear the white shirt and go to church and mm -hmm. say the right things. Mm -hmm. And then they go home and do whatever they do. Uh, they go to, you know, the Chinese buffet mm -hmm. with their grandparents. And so that's, we're just asking, we're inviting Mormons uh, to just live more authentically in mm -hmm. their own journey. As, and I think that that's the healthiest way that, that's the healthiest, uh, I guess, um, mark that I want to leave okay. with the work that I do. So since we're on that, do you think because of this move to start talking about more Mormon expressions that talk about the restoration, this and everything else, do you think that's a part of what's behind uh, the current LDS prophet on North Temple, getting rid of the Mormon name? I do, I do. I mean, we can't, I mean, there's just speculation. No one knows for sure. Right. I mean, I think the most logical explanation is probably the easiest. I think that this is something that he believes in and he's reacting to, you know, all this external pressure and this is how he, he expresses that. I 
That's very Thanks. kind of you to phrase it that way. I, I mean, the reality is most Mormons think it's silly. Uh, and in sort of an endearing way, like I saw a meme that was floating around amongst the, the faithful communities and it's two Mormon missionaries and, and the text is, do you have 10 minutes to hear the actual name of the church? <laughs> and, and, and so, I mean, we're all sort of grappling when he, when he put it down, he didn't just put it down to change the name and to take Mormon out of it. He was like, God will be offended yeah. and it's a win for Satan. That's what he actually said. And all of us were like, whoa, you came in a little too hot. Like all you had to do is say like, hey guys, like it'd be cool if we stopped using this. But he was like, Jesus will cry every time you do it. And now everyone's like, oh no. Yeah. So it's been really weird to see how people uh, re respond to that. But the reality is it's not going, I mean, you can't, it's in our text, it's in our scripture, it's in our identity. Uh, for him to take that out would mean erasing 200 years of history mm -hmm. uh, like what are we going to do go through you know all of the journals or the prophets and scratch out the word mormon and write in the correct uh, like w was jesus sad then was satan winning then it's just silly mm -hmm. so uh we we heard that and we're just like oh that's mm -hmm. fun move along it's fascinating because you started off and you cited occam's razor of saying the most simple explanation is the one you're going to go with but then what you said beyond that <laughs> was a heck of a lot different. <laughs> I like to make things messy, what can I say? God, I'm yeah. learning that. Yeah. All right. So go back. Uh, you're in, what were your uh, interests as a LDS girl on going to Sundays, Chinese dinner, but you're, you're going to church with mom, maybe a little with dad. Were you, were you believing in the Joseph Smith story? Did you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Book of Mormon. Yeah, no, I'm, so Mormonism is so valuable to me. And I, and I would say, I mean, when you see a, basically a giant Mormon nerd like me now, or Mormon freak, if you want to think of it that way, which is accurate. <laughs> it's because I was so invested. I mean, the people that are so invested in this movement now are people that were super invested before, right? Mm -hmm. It's uh, It was a key part of my identity, and I still think that it is. So, uh, yeah, I loved it. I, I grew up in a neighborhood uh, in the heart of the Salt Lake Valley where I thought everyone in the world was Mormon, mm -hmm. you know? Everyone I knew was Mormon, everyone I knew. I, I grew up, we never moved. I grew up with the same kids that I went to preschool with all the way through high school. And in our congregation, which we call a ward, uh, there, are, there were 26 kids my age, and mm. six of them were girls and the rest were boys. And so we just like, that was my family, you know, and I just have so many beautiful, brilliant memories. Like to me, that, that was Mormonism. Now, and I see it differently now as I've sort of been challenged and gone through life experiences and realizing that like it worked really well for me because I fit, mm -hmm. but there were other kids on the fringes within that neighborhood that we contributed to a really painful upbringing to because we were so, you know, tight knit. And I remember the first time <laughs> I found out one of my friends at school wasn't Mormon. Mm -hmm. I, it, it's like, I, it was like finding out, you know, about Easter Bunny or something. Turn, I hope no kids are listening. The, the Easter you know, Bunny that, is awesome. That the Easter Bunny's furry. That the Easter Bunny is awesome. Uh, I was just like, I, I, I don't understand. I was so hurt. I was like, how can you not be? Mm. But why aren't you? And she was a Methodist, which I didn't know what that was. It sounded like a very scary word. And uh, <laughs> she, she was my first exposure. And unfortunately, you know, I had to grapple with, I did so many things, I would say, harmful things in the name of religion. Um, I think a lot of my work has been a sort of atonement for that, if you will, because I'll, I'll tell my Mormon people all the time, you know, we have this, this thing that we say in Mormonism, which is don't take the Lord's name in vain. Mm -hmm. And what they mean is don't say the G word, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. you can say suck in a Mormon household and you'll be in trouble. But if you say the G word, you're like, you lose all privileges. Mm -hmm. So we just thought like you can't say that because it disrespects God. But as I have grown and dealt with very difficult shadow parts of my faith, uh, I realized God's a big boy, mm -hmm. right? Like God can handle a curse word. Mm -hmm. uh, God sees mass rape in the Congo. Like he can handle swear word. Like when we take his name in vain, it's using his name to harm others. And, mm -hmm. and that's what I did. And my intentions, I would say, were um, faithful to to my values at the time, 
but the impact of them were really different. And so, yeah, I have many times where I would wound or judge or exclude people because I felt like I was standing up for the right thing, standing mm -hmm. up for God. Mm -hmm. And so many people do that in all religions, you know, but they do it a lot in, in Mormonism. You know, I get what you're saying. Uh, so you, uh, high school, what kind of student were you? I was a people pleaser, as sort of a golden child. I mean, maybe my parents would tell you otherwise, but I feel like I was a good student. Um, I was an artist. Mm. I really excelled at painting, and so uh, I had a lot of promise. Um, so I was voted best artist in mm. high school. And that was just kind of my identity. I would uh, go do all my stuff. I was an athlete. I played uh, sports. I played softball. It was a great love of mine. I, um, basketball I was pretty good at, but art was like my thing, Got right? It. But I just did, I was like on the Mormon program. I was in Mormon seminary. I ran with all the like Mormon kids and, you know, ultimate Frisbee at the parks every Friday night. and Steak dances. I hate ultimate Frisbee, by the way. Uh, Steak dances every, yeah, every steak dance we could go to. We just lived for those. Mm -hmm. Like, again, I just had a really sort of beautiful experience because it worked well for me. I was a little white girl on the Wasatch Front, you know. You sound like John DeLynn. That's how he describes it. He, did, he just loved, not a white girl on the Wasatch Front, but, uh, <laughs> although you never know with John. Uh, no, but uh, he just loves, this, I mean, he calls well, himself I mean, Nephi. It's probably, I mean, I wouldn't go that far, but I, that's because there are no women in our scripture. All right. Lives. How many in the Book of Mormon? Six? I'm like Jacob's sister. You can call me Jacob's sister. <laughs> uh, so I, th I don't think it's any coincidence that John and I are in similar roles. I mean, we had similar experiences. It was so tied into our identity, and that's that's who we were, that's what we loved. And, and in some ways, I, I see the work that we do now as an expression of that, mm -hmm. that gratitude, but also an atonement. Mm. Got it. So uh, after high school, where'd you go? This is where it gets fun. Um, when I was- Roll the tape! Roll the tape. <laughs> start, start Start showing out. that video we got out. from our college years. <laughs> Mormon girl goes wild. I wish I would have been so much more fun that way. No, no, no. Um, so I, when I was 17 years old in my art class, uh, I fell in love with this kid, this senior uh, who was a year older than me. And he went on a mission and I, I was gonna wait for him. So what that means is they go on a two year church mission and at the time we were not allowed to email or anything. You could write them a snail mail letter uh, and they could call home on Christmas and Mother's Day, and if their moms were cool, then the girlfriend could go. So uh, I decided to do that, and I waited for this missionary, and it just, like, it, I think it was, I felt a lot of shame at the time, but it was so hard for me. Like, I just fell deep in, like, this sort of puppy love with this person, and he left, and I didn't have anywhere to talk about it because there was sort of this double standard at the time, which was, Girls need to support their missionaries. They need to not be a temptation to their missionaries. And I took that very seriously and I grappled with it. And so there were all these messages saying like, you better not uh, let yourself go because he is going on this incredible experience. He's gonna expand his mind and grow up in the gospel. And, and if you were left behind, he's gonna come home and not want you. And don't gain any weight because that's what the, you're gonna get the freshman 15. And so I'm, I'm just internalizing all of these things thinking, I can't lose this person that I care about. So I'm going to be really um, committed to this. So I started, unfortunately, I think I did the unhealthy thing, um, which is I started to lose weight and I started to obsess over my weight. And I also really, I stopped reading any secular books, <laughs> which means mm. I only read Mormon books. So I got an art scholarship up to Utah State. Mm. Uh, and it was the first time I would live away from my parents. And I moved in with a bunch of Mormon girls. And on, on the one hand, it was so beautiful. Like Utah State, it was, it's very compatible with the Mormonism that I grew up with. So we're doing the same thing, you know, we're playing ultimate frisbee on campus and <laughs> going to dances and I get called as a stake missionary for my stake and I'm like, oh good, he can be on his mission and I can be on my mission. And- Oh, pitter patter. Right, isn't it so great? Uh, very Saturday's a warrior. 
so I'm living that life, but on the other hand, this pressure that I'm internalizing is starting to sort of canker, and, and how I internalized it was with an eating disorder, and I've been quite public about it because I don't think enough women are public about it because there's so much shame and stigma attached to this. But yeah, I developed a really serious, severe eating disorder. At the time, we didn't understand what it was. I started restricting my food actually when I was 17 uh, as a result of being in a dance class and realizing like, oh no. Like, I don't look like the other girls. Mm -hmm. But it didn't get serious until uh, college when I started internalizing it with the shame. So I thought at the time that I was a sinner. Uh, the way that we understood it was that I must be vain and selfish, and I was trying to, you know, I just cared about what people thought too much. And so in Mormonism, we have this um, pretty strong rhetoric about health codes and your body is a temple. And, you know, some someone had pointed out that that abusing my body in this way was uh, abusing the temple. Mm. And so I just felt a lot of shame about it. So uh, in college, I went and I confessed to my bishop about it. And you know, uh, it, there's, there's a shameful thing in confessing to your bishop because first of all, if Mormons were kind of obsessed with sex, I don't know if you know that, but you go into the bishop's office and you come out and everybody thinks it's about sex, mm -hmm. right? So it's, so, he, so I shut that down even more. I became even more closed down to that. You know, I wouldn't kiss people on dates. I wouldn't, I, I didn't do any of that. And it just sort of compounded it. And I, I was lucky that I had a bishop who, I've heard terrible stories to the contrary, but I was lucky. My bishop said, you're not sinning. You need to see a therapist. Mm. Now, I appreciate that. I couldn't, it was, it was, he didn't compound my shame, but he didn't relieve it because what, I had associated therapy with was sort of this like worldly secular thing. I, I really believed that the church and the mm. scriptures would, could fix me mm. and that God could fix me. And so I tried a combination of both of those. I, I didn't really have a good experience with therapy at Utah State. I did it secretly. I didn't tell my parents um, that I was going to therapy. I was too embarrassed about it. And um, yeah, it was, it was a really dark, dark time. I used to one of the things I would do is I would say, okay, I'm not going to, uh, so uh, I don't know how much we want to get into this, but when you're bulimic, you will, it, they call it binge and purge, which is a nice way of saying you eat a lot and then you throw it up. Mm -hmm. So I would do that sort of un in an uncontrollable sense. And I thought, well, that's a sin. Mm -hmm. Even the bishop said it wasn't, but he doesn't really know what I'm doing. And I'm wasting all this food and you know, all, just all this guilt and shame. And so I would plan on Sundays, it was a Sabbath, so I wasn't going to do that on, the sun, on Sunday. I would do it every other day of the week. And so I, and, and it was so hard. So what I would do is I would pack a little lunch and I'd go down to the Institute building at Utah State and I'd read my scriptures all day. And I would just think, don't think about food. Don't think about food. Don't do it. Don't oh, do it. Don't Lord. do it. And what, what I was doing was just thinking about food the entire time. And then I would come home and I would wait till midnight. And there were some days that I would eat and binge and purge until I passed out, steal my roommate's food. Uh, it was really an addictive compulsion, and it was so good for me because that was when I learned something. I learned that the church didn't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. uh, I had Googled eating disorder, and I don't even know, was it Google at the time? Like, yeah. when, when, when was Napster, like mm -hmm. Napster generation? I, I went on LDS.org, and I typed in all of the keywords I could think of, and there were only one article popped up, and it was about a girl who had died from an eating disorder, sort of couched in the shame. And unfortunately, the article was written by people trying to understand that. And I appreciated that there was something, but what they did is they gave me ideas. Mm. They gave me tips. Mm. Uh, and it, so it made it worse for me, actually. And I, I, I don't blame them. I think this is a very common thing in the understanding of eating disorders at the time. But w when you have an eating disorder, uh, you're constantly, because you, it's sort of like this OCD thing, you're always looking for information uh, to contextualize your own thing. And so it's very easy to trigger people. So like one, one example is if you're a mother and you have young daughters and you're always talking about your weight. Mm. I, you know, I talked to a woman who she said her mom would write the ideal weight on the mirror for herself to motivate herself. So whatever the weight was, she would write that number on. And the little girl in her mind said, that's the ideal. That's mm. the ideal. And that's kind of how, you know, a brain works when you have an eating disorder. You're just always looking for clues. So I got really, really bad. I lost my scholarship because of it. I couldn't. Mm couldn't focus, couldn't stay at school. My whole day was focused on eating and throwing up. 
I'm wow. getting and throwing up. Yeah, and uh, and I so I had to come home, and it was sort of I come home in shame, you know. <laughs> And when you have a problem like that, you can't hide your problem, mm -hmm. right? Like it's shown on your body. Mm -hmm. And so I came back and all of a sudden it was, you know, Lindsay had been this golden child and now Lin Lindsay's vain, she's a sinner, <laughs> like something she's screwed up. Mm -hmm. And I had to walk in that. And it was really difficult for me. And probably now that I look back on it, people probably didn't care as much as I did, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, we all have our stuff. and. But there's this sort of narcissism when you have a disorder like this where I had been taught my entire life to not be a temptation, that boys would look at me, that, that men were always watching, that God was always watching. So how could I not think that everybody was watching mm. everything I did sure. all the time? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I got home and um, it was sort of the shameful return. Mm. Looking back, do you do you um, really think that this was all so that you could keep your missionary? Or no, of course not. I mean, eating disorders are super complex, yeah. and, and really, what it what it's about is about control. Mm. I didn't know this at the time, so what I was lucky that uh, you know my parents my parents didn't know what to do, the community didn't know what to do. I mean, it's just not something that there were any resources for, and so we went to a therapist with skepticism. And I went into his office and I, you know, I'm looking as a Mormon girl, like, is he Mormon? Is he not? Like, I need to know if I can trust this guy. Cause if he's not Mormon, he's going to turn me away from the church. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't tell. And it drove me crazy. Uh, he did have a wedding ring on and he would always wear button up shirts. So I just couldn't <laughs> tell. Um, and so that was the first time I think I sort of just submitted <sighs> to, it doesn't matter right? It doesn't matter. Hmm. Mormon or not, you're just going to come clean. And Mormons are really good at confession. So I confessed it all, right? And that's how I gave it to him. Like hmm. as a confession, hmm. here are all the terrible things I'm doing. Here's the, you know, all the, all the ways that I'm harming my body. Can, and then I'm, I stop and I'm waiting for him to be like, oh yeah, this is bad. Hmm. And he doesn't. He just looks at me and he was like, okay, and anything else? And I was like, yeah, but did you just hear me? I'm throwing up 17 times a day. And he was like, uh-huh. Yeah. Is that bad? And I was like, I don't know. You tell me you're the expert. Mm -hmm. And he said, Lindsay, I'm not going to take this away from you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what, what's happening? Reverse psychology. Like, and he said, no, 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 you need this. This is, this is your coping mechanism. This is, this is saving you. It's saving your brain from going crazy. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with so much pressure. Your body's trying to find a way. This is your body trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to take that away. You need this. Mm -hmm. And it was all, it was like all oh, that shame and everything just disappeared in that moment. I mean, I was so depressed. I, I'd gotten to the point where I thought you either stop uh, this, be sorry, you, I can't stop this behavior. I've tried everything. I've tried everything for two years. I tried to fix it on my own and it just made it worse. So I got to the point where I either keep going with the eating disorder or kill yourself. Mm. And in that moment, he took those choices away wow. and and he just gave me permission to kind of sit in it hmm. and once that was gone I was able to finally start healing because it wasn't about it's about control I needed to know that I was in control of myself hmm. I felt so out of control in my world I felt so beholden to pleasing everyone and this Mormon perfection and doing everything right that I, it, that's what shame does in Mormonism I think um I, I look back and most of my spiritual experiences with Mormonism were tied to shame. Hmm. Uh, my relationship with God was a shameful one because it was always either me praying for forgiveness, acknowledging how broken I was, or being relieved of that shame. It was just this cycle. I never got to even understand a God outside of that. And so my body, I think, was looking for ways to hmm. control that. And shame, you know, Mormonism gives you all these impossible goals and shame said, I'll step in and I can take care of that for you. And it did. Wow. Since you mentioned it, so that sounds like you also had a breakthrough or subsequently had a breakthrough on God. What does God mean to you now? Since we're just, since you just mentioned God and, and how you were constantly trying to measure up or he was never, it was never bright, never good enough in yeah. your life now, where are you? God's a tricky one. Um, so 
I mean, we can talk about all the in-between of how I got there because for, for a long time, I still, I call it Mormon God. So Mormon God and I, I mean, I still have a relationship with Mormon God in the sense that uh, sometimes I will pray to Mormon God and my prayers to Mormon God are angry. They're, uh, you know, I got to the point, I, I do a lot of work with, you know, some of the most marginalized abused people in this community and the things that I've seen, it's easy for me to feel very cynical. And so that's when Mormon God and I rumble, right? And I'm like, you will answer to us. We will not answer to you. Mm -hmm. Because if this is the way it is, if this is the test, if this is the way you've designed the world, you're not worth our worship. Mm -hmm. You need to be held accountable. And when I'm the most angry, it's Mormon God, right? But, you know, I've come all over the map. Intellectually, I, I could... I could say that I'm an atheist. I mean, th those arguments make sense to me. Uh, I, I'm a big proponent of uh, science and um, evolutionary biology. It's, it's just a hobby horse of mine. I think it's actually beautiful. But through st science and through evolution, I've sort of come to see this art in it, right? Mm. And as an artist, I think it gives me some flexibility to see sort of a divine orchestra, mm. if you will. And so... So God is a process for me, but I see God as sort of this divine orchestra, mm. right? But um, yeah, as they say in Game of Thrones, sometimes I pray to the old gods and the new. Mm. <laughs> it just depends. So that's a beautiful way to put your current state that you, as an artist, you see uh, God, at least in some way, if this is what it is, uh, in artistically. So would that, I'm not trying to set you up, but would you see therefore him being at least there being a creator yeah i mean so you know i this is this is actually it's become less and less a painful thing for me to explore and more such an interesting thing for me to to explore so and the work that i do i'm so fortunate i get to deal with the like world's top biblical scholars right mm -hmm. i get to interact with some of the world's brightest minds on religion and it's such a gift so i'm constantly open to new ideas mm. and that's why i say it's a process and and honestly i think i was harmed by this idea of this binary sort of uh, brittle god that like mm. this is what god is and it never changes and it's like that's dumb because our relationships to anyone are always fluid because we are changing mm -hmm. and and i want to give space to that i think you know when you I don't know if, you, if you've ever read Bill Bryson. He has this book called, uh, it's, I think it's called like a short history of nearly everything. Mm. And he, it's just like a really digestible history of the universe. Mm. And in the first two chapters, he brilliantly talks about the creation of the universe and the Big Bang Theory and what happens. And I got to tell you, like it, it was the spiritual experience for me, mm. absent of shame, where I'm reading about how every single, and he has this beautiful line, I wish I could quote it, but he says something like, if you were to understand how amazing it is that we're alive, it means that none of our previous ancestors were eaten by a predator or destroyed. They found the exact right partner to match up. The temperature of the earth and the universe, if it were off even a fraction, would mean nothing. And to me, that is, that is where this God is, right? Like, I don't know what it means. I don't know what it is, but there, there's some magic in the universe, mm. and I'm not going to let my religious pain rob me from that. Fantastic. Really, really well said. My God, this is very beneficial to our audience. Oh. It's been uh, fascinating. We're still going. So you left school. You, you had the bulimia problem. You came, you found what sounds like a uh, brilliant therapist. Yeah. And uh, then what happened? What, what your life then? So I ended up not marrying this missionary. I uh, was I that would, good. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I, I will never have an opportunity to understand. Do you ever think about it? Of course I do. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> of course I do. Thank you for being honest. No, <laughs> you'll get honesty from me. I've got daughters, man. No, it shaped my life. I mean, this story. The reason why I bring this story up is not to tell this like little Romeo and Juliet story. It was a cornerstone piece in my life. I mean. Uh, yeah, I'm still going to be dealing with the impact of that for a long time because you don't, in Mormonism, so many of your choices are based on an idea, right? And it, it's not even just an idea. It's like how you interpret the idea. And when that changes, you're like, what the hell just happened? Um, and, and that 
has positioned, it's been a very painful process for me, but that has positioned me to do the work that I do, right? Uh, so yeah, I married, I was so sick. I was, um, had lost a lot of weight. I was engaging in really <laughs> risky behavior, not sexual behavior because that's what everyone always thinks. Uh, just really dangerous physical behavior. And I just didn't care. I mean, I didn't care and I needed to get out of my house. Uh, and uh, I met this nice young Mormon kid that was home from his mission and he was ready. Mm. And because I couldn't confront you know, the control issues in my own life, I wasn't ready to do that. Marriage was a nice distraction mm. from that. And, and that sounds like a very dismissive thing to say about him, but like, because he's lovely, but he, um, he was the same way. He got off his mission. He was told that he needed to get married as soon as possible. And in Mormonism, when you don't date very long because you're not supposed to have sex. And we were good kids. And so we had a very fast engagement and we were very close. We had some top stuff over the shirt. And um, had we have not, like w one of the things our bishop told us at the time, because you to get in the temple, you have to no top stuff, no definitely no bottom stuff, no top stuff, um, and you can't get married in the temple. And then, so it, it's sort of this be, this shameful thing because you get engaged, you send out the invitations, and if you cancel the wedding, I don't care for what reason. Everybody thinks it's because oh, yeah. of top and bottom stuff. Yeah. And um, so we were like working with the bishop, and he said, "You guys are pushing it." And like, we are this close to yanking your temple oh. recommend. And, and I'm telling you guys, like, it was the most innocent thing. Like it was, it was really just top stuff. And twice. <laughs> and why you're even counting still. That's awesome. That's how a Mormon kid thinks. That's how a Mormon kid thinks. Twice. And so the bishop said, you're not allowed to kiss anymore um, until you're engaged. And that screwed us up. Oh. Like, we we talked about that for years like it, it's never been the same like because we're just kids just wanting to make out yeah. you know and so we got married super fast and i was really lucky again because he's such a lovely person and he sort of rescued me from that i think the problem was is we both thought it would be okay like you know it didn't matter how we got together but it would be okay and we loved each other and we were kind to each other and he's so kind and um and then you know fast forward two years later it didn't it didn't work out, um, but he's still such a dear person to me because, and, and we get along really well because we went through that experience together. Good. And I'm lucky that he's generous enough to understand my pain. I mean, it's not anything I ever chose. Mm -hmm. So this is tricky because people around me will say, you chose it, we couldn't have talked you out of it, but is it a decision when everything in your life drives you to that moment? Sure. And you know, I. Sure, I chose it, and if you were to talk me out of it back then, you couldn't have. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I needed it, mm -hmm. and it showed up, and, th and that was the only way I was healthy enough to, to survive, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and so that's what I did. So just uh, to springboard off that, as just a side thought, your thoughts on free will? That's a tricky one. So in Mormonism, we call it free agency. Yeah. And it's one of the, I would say, one of the founding principles in Mormonism. I mean, we, our whole origin story, our whole, what we call the plan of happiness, our whole sort of cosmology is based on this idea that we have free agency. Mm -hmm. And I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. This is the lesson that I learned very young. And I'm so glad it was, I was an 18 year old girl and I got to learn this hard truth, which is there are things that are compulsive Mm -hmm. that you cannot control. And I'm telling you that I learned this so deep, it's just died into my bones that you, I would have done anything to stop this behavior. And I did, I did do everything short of taking my own life and I couldn't stop it. Mm. And I learned something really quickly that uh, sometimes there are things beyond our control. Mm -hmm. But it's been a hard lesson because I still have this deep sense of fairness, right? I want everything to be equitable. I want it to be fair. I want it to match up, and life doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's a constant grapple that I have. But I I think that we fundamentally as human beings misunderstand this concept. Mm -hmm. I think if we could understand this concept, we could have more empathy towards humans. And it's sure. it's really informed my work. I mean, I I deal with some people who have done enormous harm. Uh, sexual predators, uh, 
abusers, cult leaders, and um, yeah, I, I, I can afford a little bit of compassion because I understand shame and mm -hmm. secrecy. Mm -hmm. I understand the, the mechanism that that plays in compulsion. And once you're in that place where you can't even control your own behavior, then all bets are off. Mm -hmm. and, and I wish that we would look at addiction. I wish we would look at compulsion with a little bit more compassion because the people that are stuck in these situations don't want to be. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to be a monster, right. right? No one wants to be a sinner. No one wants to be uh, all of these things that, we, that we're trying to label to understand. And so, yeah, it's been, I think, sort of a blessing. Mm -hmm to learn this. So just to rephrase, do you believe that, you know, it's deterministic because of genetics and, and environment? Or do you, do you think there's still, I mean, in your situation and with your specific thing, it was out of your control completely and we get that. But in, in terms of life, are people making choices? So I would, I would say my experience in the compulsion is on one side of uh, the spectrum. And, and you could argue that it's biology that determined that or chemicals or situation. I think um, I don't have a hard line on anything. I, my Mormonism taught me to sort of, and this is where I'm at, I reserve the right to change my mind as I learn and grow, but I never want to believe in something so black and white again that I'm so sure. Got it. Because as a Mormon, I think one of the most painful things for me to experience was certainty mm. and have that taken away. Mm. I mean, when you're 10 years old and you know, you know the answers to every, mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm that sort of hubris to, to fall from that is, is probably a wound that I will never mm. get over. It's made you wise. Uh, it's made me cautious. Mm. Really good. So after the, uh, after the marriage, what, what happened? School? What, what's um, going on with you so, and your development of your mind? So, well, and my Mormon marriage is a huge part of it. It's, uh, so I, we, we got on the Mormon program. We moved out to Stansbury Park, Utah. We bought a little starter home, as everybody does. We would buy another home, as everyone was doing out there, and we were in a very Mormon community. And the women in my family, they're all educators. And so uh, it was just, I had spent so much time working with children. Um, actually, one of the jobs I had, I was the district arts coordinator for mm -hmm. Emory School District. We had a grant at the time, and at, at, I had, even though I was, sort of came home shamefully from school, I had this like career because uh, of my connections and because of my skill set. And so I'm working in the, you know, in the school district and then I get pregnant. And I wanted to stay home. That's a value in, in Mormon homes. And so I decided to quit that job, which was a great job, and quit my insurance <laughs> and become a preschool teacher because that's mm -hmm. what the women in my family do. When we have babies, we teach preschool. So I st sort of started this like preschool dynasty out in, in Stansbury Park, mm -hmm. like it was the thing. Everyone called me Miss Lindsay and I loved it. Um, and I raised my babies. But as it was going along, an interesting thing happened. There was a little girl uh, um, in our neighborhood who was uh, assaulted. She was walking to my house and it was said that she was flashed by mm -hmm. a man. And we, you know, we were just like in this uproar because there was a predator outside my preschool. Like he must have known. So all the Mormon moms were all upset. We're all on high alert. Um, and there was a gay man in our neighborhood, openly gay man, and we would all gossip about him and and be suspicious of this strange person in our in our midst. And we decided he must be the person that did it because, of course, gay men love little girls. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, <laughs> But we did, and as the story sort of grew and grew, there became changing details and all of these things. I started to think something's not right here. You know, like now the now the story was that he was wearing women's clothing, and so he allowed the police to come check his home for women's clothing, and and it wasn't until the allegations started to surround my home, like someone said, "Well, she said that your husband was home," and I'm ashamed to admit it. My husband wasn't home; he was at work. But it took all of that for me to say. This, that's a lie. like it's a provable lie, you know, like we know that that's not true. And so I just get on the internet and I just like, do gay men assault little girls? <laughs> and I start reading about this stuff and I just get so excited because I'm like, whoa, intersex. I had no idea that people can be born with two parts. Wow, biology is so interesting. Mm. And, and I'm just like excited and I'm like, I figured this out. They just don't know. And this is just how dumb I was. 
I had, I always say, I never, it's not that I didn't have enough faith in my church, it's so that I had too much faith. Because mm. <laughs> I go to my ward that Sunday, and they're talking about how the world's going to hell in a handbasket and all this stuff, and, and can you believe that we have predators in our midst? And I was like, no, guys, we got it all wrong. Actually, have you ever heard of intersex people? <laughs> and, uh, and it was just like, everyone's quiet, and we ignore it, and we move on. And I, I'm just like... I don't know what happened. And uh, eventually what had happened was uh, all the women in my stake uh, band together and pulled their children out of my preschool uh, wow. without, without telling me. And they, you know, as my, as my uh, theories and ideas about this sort of grew and I talked about it and I, I got to say, like, I was pretty careful. Like, I'm, I'm insane now. Like, you can Google, don't Google me, but you can Google me and there's all kinds of crazy stuff. But at the time I was just, you know, talking to a few people. Mm-hmm. But the, I, I heard later on from some of the mothers that they were worried that I was going to make their kids gay. Mm. And I was too liberal. Mm. And it was devastating for me. Uh, it was devastating because I believed up until that point that my Mormon community cared about truth. Mm. That they cared about... And, and even if what, what I was saying wasn't true, like why should I be rejected? Just like correct me on it, right? Mm-hmm. But that's not what happened. Um, I once had a woman crying, a neighbor, a close friend cry and tell me I was possessed by the devil and she left my house. Mm. And so we eventually, uh, I had to, I didn't know what else to do. I was really angry at the church. This is when I go through, this is when I went through what I would call, I call it the angry like ex-Mormon phase, which gets, gets, people are so mean to ex-Mormons, right? They're like, they're so angry. Well, this is why. <laughs> like, you can't, like, punch someone and be like, why are you crying? You know what I mean? <laughs> and that's what we do to ex-Mormons all the yeah. time. And I'm so glad that I had that experience, too. But I was also lucky because I had another unique experience, which was I had decided that I was going to, like, <laughs> I probably shouldn't admit this on camera, but I'm going to. I, I decided I was going to uh, do some street art in Salt Lake City, like Banksy up Salt Lake mm. as, like, a little Mormon mom. Because I was still an artist, and the Exit Through the Gift Shop documentary had just come out, Mm. and I thought Binksy was the coolest thing, and I was like, we are wrong about this. So I, like, bought the stuff. I bought the templates. I was, like, gonna, I was gonna go, like, protest, because I had no one else to talk to in my life. My husband, like, he knew I was mad, but he was like, just settle down. Mm. And so I, it was, like, this compulsive thing. It was compulsive, and I was gonna do it. And then my husband found out and he was like, you're a mom, like you can't (laughs) do this. And, and so I, then I felt shame. Like the, the devil has gotten a hold of me. He really has. And, um, at the same time I found a feminist Mormon housewives, which was a blog. I wasn't a feminist. I thought I was, I was pretty, I guess I was a Democrat. Lisa, Lisa, who started it. Uh, I'm not a Democrat now, but she, Lisa said, I thought I was a feminist too, but what the, I was just a Democrat. (laughs) Well, we didn't know what feminist was. So she had this blog, and they were just the only place that could talk a little bit about stuff. Mm. So they asked me to, you know, I messaged them, and they liked my writing, and they said, will you blog for us? And then then the Banksy up graffiti art thing kind of just, like, disappeared because I had an outlet. Um, So that's how I started blogging. Wow. And it was, and so that was the experience that I had, which was, I found a group of Mormon women who, where I was like, I am angry about some stuff. Mm. And they were like, yeah. You should be. And I'm like, wait, what? You can do that and still be Mormon? And and that, I think, is what has given me a unique position because most Mormons are not that lucky. I mean, the experience they have is similar to what I first experienced, which is shame, exclusion. Mm-hmm. We doubled down. We think, I mean, it's getting better now, but mm-hmm. when I went through it, it was, it was really, it was a rough experience. And I just think that I had an outlet. But this is an important thing, too. That This is why I bring up the missionary story. Uh, I went into, I had gotten called um, before I lost my preschool to be in the stake leadership uh, for girls camp. And I love girls camp. It was like, it's, that's my Mormonism, right? That and the cannery. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, got, I had gotten the only more ex-Mormon in the room. like, I know what you're talking about. Um, so I, I was so excited to get this calling, and, but I felt such shame and and I said to the first counselor in the state presidency, I said, can I like confess something to you? I know you're not my bishop. And he was like, sure, <laughs> all excited. Like, what are we gonna find out today? And I was just like, 
I said, I can't accept this calling. I'm not worthy. And he was like, why not? And I said, I, I said, I have been in love with this other person my whole life, and I've tried to pray it away. I've tried to, to go away, and I can't. I'm a married woman, and I'm still thinking about this other person because I never had any closure on that. And his face just got so excited. And he was just like, oh, I can help you with this. <laughs> and, and he was like, I went through the same thing. I was in love with someone else that wasn't my wife. Turns out this is a very common story to a lot of Mormons, like most Mormons, because we all get married super young and don't figure that out. But anyway, he was just like, yeah, I was in love with this woman, and I thought about her for years. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. How, so what did you do? How, and he was like, I got it figured out. Let me tell you, this is a little controversial, and we don't say this, you know, at church. But I prayed about this, and I just realized that my feelings weren't sin, sinful. They were of God, because God is just preparing my heart for polygamy. And I remember very vividly over his shoulder, I don't remember him saying that. I remember uh, there was a picture of Jesus, and it was him in the red robes. Yeah. And I just remember staring at the red as he was saying this. And I just remember thinking, how does this help me? Yeah. How does this help me? Like, it didn't even occur to him that I yeah. wouldn't have the same ability. Like, oh, I'm so great. Do I get to marry two dudes? Is that yeah. how this works? <laughs> like, it just didn't even occur to me. He was so pleased with himself. Wow. Like, see, I figured it out. And I was just like, I need to get out of this room as fast as I can. Wow. And, and, and I had several experiences like that that really put polygamy in my mind. I hated it. Mm. I hated it. Mm. And it felt so deeply unfair. And it triggered this idea of, that I felt with the double standard on the mission. He got all the support, and I was the caution, the caution right? Mm. Like, I was the thing that could ruin it all. I could mm. ruin the perfect missionary for his family. I could ruin his perfect mission. And, and I took that seriously and was wounded by it. So here it was again. Mm. Wow. We have uh, three minutes and some seconds left of this fascinating fast-paced, articulate interview. Uh, Lindsay, you do a, blo uh, you do a podcast. Mm -hmm. Is, has it been going on for how long now? Um, it's called A Year of Polygamy, and we're in the fourth year. So. Yes. Uh, a year in polygamy. Of polygamy. Of. It was meant to be one year of polygamy, and not me living it, me exploring the subject. It's the history of Mormon polygamy from the beginning until now. Wow. And it just sort of took off, and we can talk about this in the next interview because okay. this is where the good stuff, like, my, my life is boring. The, this stuff is good. So, uh, yeah, uh, the history of polygamy, and it's just sort of catapulted me into this world of fundamentalists okay. and polygamists and, um, yeah, all, all types right. of crazy things. People Mormon. can get that how? Yearofpolygamy.com. Okay. I always say start at the beginning. You'll have to hear sweet little LDS Lindsay be like, hey, guys, it's okay. It's going to be great. <laughs> and then... Like, it's like episode, I think, 38 or 39. It's been a while where I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> what have I done? Wow. And it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of fun. Fascinating. And then uh, how long have you been with Sunstone? We're just, re we're just kind of letting people know what we're going to be start, start with next week. Yeah, Sunstone, uh, gosh, five, five or six years. Wow. But they took me in after I lost my preschool. So it's okay. kind of great. Fantastic. Uh, one last thing before we wrap up tonight. Uh, do you have a message? Your therapist gave you such good insights, but there are a lot of parents and there are a lot of girls who deal with uh, eating disorders. Do you have something that you would just generally say to them before we wrap up tonight? Because that was really um, an important part of your development. You learned so much going through it. Uh, what would you say to the women, girls who deal with that? I think the first thing I would say is there's nothing wrong with you. Okay. Your body is just doing what it's doing. It's trying to take care of you. And you can let it take care of you this way, or you can find healthier ways. Mm -hmm. and, and that's up to you to decide, right? Mm -hmm. But your family and friends are going to be concerned mm -hmm. because sometimes it's risky behavior. And so if everyone can just give space for that and realize that even if bad behaviors are acted out, uh, intentions are usually almost good. I mean, people that have eating disorders are probably some of the most sensitive people. They mm. internalize so much, and that's why they, it shows up in this way. And so, you know, I would say to parents, uh, do things that let them feel in control of their world. And my therapist, this was a good analogy. He said, you know, because I came in one time after, after I was getting the eating behaviors under control, I would change my clothes a lot. 
And I was like, I'm changing my clothes like five times a day. And he was like, yeah, yeah, like picture you're standing on a floor of fire and it pops up through the hole and you're like, oh no, I gotta go put that out. So you go put it out. Well, it's gonna pop up over here. So then you run over and change your clothes a lot. And he said, I'm interested in the fire underneath. Mm. And so if you have an eating disorder, that's, what, that's where your work is. Mm. It's on the fire underneath. You have to figure out what is, what is causing this anxiety. And that's a process and you gotta be patient with it. It's not gonna be cured overnight. It's something I'm going to always struggle with mm. if I'm not careful. But you can take your lessons and learn them and um, allow yourself to be a little bit messy. Mm. You don't have to figure it out and be perfect at it. That's mm. what I'd say. You know, uh, by the people who know you, by, by the way, I was at the U of U today doing something and uh, uh, someone said something about uh, a guest we had last week, and then I said, well, tonight we're having, oh, she changed my life. I, I have met about five, no, no, four women this past week and a half that have said you have directly uh, influenced them in a positive way. So uh, you've lived up to far more than... Uh, uh, what I expected, and uh, and I expected a lot. I was intimidated, but fantastic interview. I look so forward to next week, and really appreciate you being with us. Join us next week with uh, Lindsay Hansen Park here on Heart of the Matter.